our next speaker to talk about time um, is out of some great work he's done, uh, is our friend and colleague from the UK, John Swinton. You have to put on your English listening ears. Uh, uh, but he will tell you how much of a pleasure it is for you to watch him while he talks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everybody. You know, it's not very often that I find myself uh, deeply moved by the words of a pastor. <laughs> but when Pastor Weissner this morning said, you are beautiful, I felt he was speaking to me. <laughs> it was amazing. Thank you so much for the blessing. <laughs> I want this morning to uh, uh, talk to you about time. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've been working on a project on um, disability and time. And I want us to think about uh, the significance of time for disability. And a lot of the stuff that's been talked about this morning is actually very closely related to the issue of time. But the place I want us to begin to think things through is with the issue of imagination. I don't know if you think very much about imagination, but imagination is fundamentally important for the way in which we make sense of the world. You know, it would be almost impossible for us to cross the road safely if we weren't able to imagine in a particular way. Um, but imagination doesn't come from nowhere. It always comes from some kind of context, some kind of social uh, basis. And so think about it this way. Your imagination contains the assumptions, the worldview, the methodologies, the plausibility structures, what Peter Berger talks about, that which in any context you think is plausible or implausible. All of the different things that help you to make sense of the world relate to your imagination. And so in a real sense, you're taught how to imagine the world. Then that's happened, we're taught how to imagine the world for better or for worse, which is one reason why um, uh, in sci-fi sci books, aliens tend to be big, big, thin humans because we haven't got the concepts to move beyond our assumptions of what certain life forms would look like. But imagination is profoundly important in relation to the things that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about for the past few days. Because we are taught what disability is, we are taught what it means to be a human being, and we are given a very narrow imagination within which to make sense of human uh, being, human difference, and the issues that we're talking about. I want us to think about what it might mean to expand our imagination. And I think time will help us to do that. Walter Brueggemann talks about the way in which scripture and tradition is intended to refund your imagination, to give you concepts, ideas, stories that help you to see the world differently. So the world is exactly the same, but once you begin to imagine it differently, you see it differently. And when you, have, uh, when you see things differently, there are different possibilities begin to emerge. And so I want us to try and reimagine um, time. I want to give you some kind of concepts, ideas, some pictures and some stories that help us to make sense of the world in a slightly different way. You know, time is one of these things that we take for granted, but it's actually fundamental to everything we do. The way we structure our world, the way we structure ourselves, the way we look at one another is profoundly underpinned by particular understandings of time. And if you think about it, you know, I'm, I was trying to work it out myself today. Since I got up this morning at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> uh, that's because you guys have got such strange time. <laughs> You've also driving the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Anyway, I was contemplating, I, I, I must have been using about four or five different modes of time. So I was looking at my iPad, I was looking at my phone, and then I was looking at the clock in my room, and then I was listening to the radio, and every 20 minutes they gave me the time, and then I was watching the television, and there's a little clock. Everywhere I was looking, there was clocks. Our whole life seems to be shaped and formed by time in that sense. And when we think about something like you know, disability studies, disability theology. Time's always 
running around in the midst of that. Take the medical conversation around disability, something like the words chronic or acute or developmental uh, uh, disability or prognosis. You know, all of these things have their own timelines and they, they place different modes of disability in different timelines. And these timelines determine your expectation. And even within disability theology, you can see time sits right at the heart of some of our central concepts. The whole conversation around, for example, um, will there be disabilities in heaven has to do with a particular eschatological understanding of time, what will happen in the future, what the timeline is, how we should understand ourselves now and in the future. And even something that we uh, you know, use regularly, like temporarily uh, able-bodied, that suggestion that actually there's no uh, dichotomy uh, between people with disabilities and anybody who doesn't have disabilities, eventually we'll all have disabilities. So our so-called able-bodiedness is a temporary state. Over time, we'll all become disabilities, disabled. It's a matter of time. And so when you begin to notice time, you see it everywhere. But what you also begin to see is that time has a tendency to be tyrannical. You know, you buy time, you waste time, you use time. In a capitalist society, everything that you do with your time, you do, uh, your money, you do with your time. And it oppresses you. We are genuinely the people of the book, but it's usually a diary or a schedule. We're always scheduling, scheduling our life, even our spiritual life. We somehow have to fit God in. You know, we have to have half an hour quiet time. And so even the divine who creates us has to find space in their diaries. <laughs> but it's true that we are driven by time, and time, the, the drivenness that time gives to us makes us anxious, makes us sad, makes us uncomfortable. Even when we achieve big things, we're always afraid in case we're going to lose them. Even when we're successful, we're afraid in case we're going to lose our success. So time is fundamental, but time, as Augustine puts it, uh, has fallen. Augustine tells the creation story as God creating the world and everything in it is good, including time. God creates time. So time is a creature. It's part of fallen creation. When creation falls, time falls. It becomes oppressive. It loses its goal. It loses its, its uh, uh, telos, its direction in that sense. And so with the coming of Jesus... Something different happens. You begin that process of redeeming time. And to redeem time is to take time, take fallen time and put it to its proper purposes. So there's something really important about recognizing the significance of the time that's given to us and what we're intended to do with the time that is given to us. What, we're, what's intended, to, what we are intended to do is to take time and to put it to the purposes that it was intended for, to redeem time in that sense. But what would it look like to redeem time? Okay, I'm saying to you that time is oppressive. Speed, time is things that are expected. If you can't keep up the world's time, then you can be crushed very easily. If you're slow in thought or movement, people think you're odd. And yet, when you begin to look at the nature of time as revealed in scriptures, something really strange happens. We think that when we look at our watch, we can see time moving. We think that time moves forward in a kind of linear, progressive way. But then you look in the scriptures and suddenly you find that, you know, God is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, all at the same time. You find that Jesus says to the, the, the robber beside him, tomorrow you'll be with me in, in paradise. And then in Matthew 25, you find that actually that's going to happen at a different period in time. Paul tells us that um, we have died and have been risen in Christ. Now, how on earth could we be died and have risen in something that happened 2,000 years ago? So you've got a completely different understanding of time. It's not linear and progressive. It's actually flat. It's all happening just here in this mysterious place where we participate in God's time. But God's time is radically different from the way that we understand time to be. There's a Japanese theologian called Kusaka Kiyama, Kusaka Kiyama 
who uh, wrote a wonderful essay a few years ago, and it was called The Three Mile an Hour of God. Uh, and he had, it's all about time, really. And he says, um, 40 years in the desert is God's basic educational strategy. <laughs> And then he says, uh, he points out that the average speed that a human being walks at is three miles per hour. So he says then, Jesus walks, walked at three miles per hour. Jesus, who is God, who is love, walks at three miles per hour. And then he says, love has its speed. But it's not a speed in the sense that we busy people understand speed. It's not a speed that wants to get ahead. It's not a speed that wants to get to a destination as quickly as possible. It's actually slowness. Slowness is the nature of the divine. Slowness is the nature of God. And slowness is the speed that Jesus walked and walks in that sense. So if Bill, you're a workaholic, you're probably work, walking too fast. More than that, you're probably walking ahead of Jesus. <laughs> Because I, I remember having this conversation with a, a, a physician, and he said, quite rightly, this uh, organization makes me work at nine miles an hour. How could I possibly work at, walk at three miles an hour? And I just simply said to him, well, who are you following? Who are you following? He may say, oh, it sounds ridiculous. But then most of the gospel sounds ridiculous. <laughs> so there's something really important about slowing down recognizing the giftedness of the time that we have and beginning to see the world differently. Now, what would that look like? Well, maybe it looks like this. Um, a couple of years ago, I was across in um, Trolley in France, a, a, a large uh, community uh, meeting with Jean Vanier. And in the evening, we went to one of the... Um, facilities, La Forestière, which is a place where people with um, quite significant intellectual disabilities live. Uh, and we sat and uh, uh, had a meal together. Now, the first thing for me was obviously I don't speak French, and I was in France. <laughs> so I had a communicational issue, and I suddenly realized what, how, how uh, profound communicational issues are, because I had lots of things I wanted to say, but there was just no space and no way I could say them like. And that wasn't because there was anything wrong with me other than I don't know that language. It was simply because we didn't have that space for communication. We didn't have the tools to facilitate that. So I, I, that, for me, that embodied something important. But at the end of the meal, um, when everybody else was uh, clearing up and doing washing, uh, washing the dishes, I was sitting at the table. That's what I do at home as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind, of a, it's kind of a boy thing, or, or maybe, it's just a, maybe it's just a me thing. Anyway, there was only the three of us left at the table, and Jean Vanier was sitting there, and then uh, there was a, a lady, um, uh, Louise, who sat beside them. And she had a, a, a profound intellectual disability, and uh, she was just kind of sitting, moving her head, uh, and not really engaging with um, uh, what was going on. But Jean looked at her. And the thing that, about Jean Vanier, uh, for those of you who have met him, is he's able to get past social norms. Because if you look at somebody for 45 seconds, usually it seems a bit unusual. But he just looked at her. Uh, and she kind of didn't engage, didn't engage. And then she began to, to move her hand, just to tap the table. And eventually, uh, she turned around and caught Jean's gaze. So she had her hand just tapping the table. And Jean kept his gaze for an inordinately awkward amount of time. And, but then he put his hand on top of her uh, uh, hand. And the two of them moved together in a beautiful kind of cadence of unspoken, um, I don't know whether it was love, it was certainly some mode of grace. And you could just see that the way they caught their eyes together, the way that their bodies moved rhythmically together, they were able to come together in a wordless embrace, which really opened up a space that for anybody else looking in simply wasn't there. But because he was able to slow down, because he was able to recognize and look in a quite particular way, i.e. just look at this woman as a woman, 
And because he and she gave him permission to, to engage in that gentle uh, touch, things were opened up. But it's only when you enter into the speed of the three mile of an hour God that these things become a possibility. And you begin to see that your stereotypes, your assumptions about the way the world, your imagination, the way that, in this case, Louise was imagined, is just wrong. And if we open things up, things begin to change. But there's another interesting dimension to, to, to God's time that I want us to think about. And that relates to... Um, a book that Walter Brueggemann brought out two years ago, uh, maybe three years ago. It's a book called Sabbath as Resistance. You should introduce it. It's really interesting. Though. And he's talking, obviously, about the Sabbath. But one of the things that he says or points out is that Pharaoh's big problem was anxiety. And so he uh, really oppressed the, the, the slaves in terrible ways primarily because he was anxious that the grain uh, vaults would be uh, empty when the famine came. So the more anxious he became, the more oppressive he became to push things down. So he was successful, he was powerful, but he was anxious in case he was going to lose that. And so he, the, 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 the slaves were uh, the product of his anxiety. And in some senses, they were, I don't know, his diazepine or whatever way you want to put it his anxiety-relieving drug. The Valium was what I was looking for. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> now, anyway, um, so Brueggemann points out, what does God do? What does Yahweh do in that situation? Does he send in armies? Does he send in angels to kind of destroy Pharaoh? And he points out, no, he doesn't. What does he do? He says, take a rest. Find the Sabbath. Take a day when you can think only of me. Refresh your imagination, even in the midst of this terrible situation, is effectively what he, he, he's saying. And Brueggemann points out this, this is ridiculous. But at the same time, in terms of resistance, taking a Sabbath is profoundly important. If you don't, if, you know, if, if you, you, I don't know whether you're Sabbath people or Sabbath keepers in that sense, but those uh, busy professionals that I know who take Sabbath have a tendency to read their emails, <laughs> right? So they'll take a day off, but they'll always read it, be checking their emails. God says, take a Sabbath. Slow down, sit quietly, focus in on the Lord. Don't be a workaholic. So, the idea of workaholic comes from, we know it's in the, he talked about it as uh, uh, an unhealthy attitude towards your work. So I've been sent by the Lord to help you, Bill. <laughs> I've known that for a long time. Aye, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so slow down, take a Sabbath. Now, it may be very, very difficult for us to take Sabbath because we are busy people and we live in a culture where, where that's not the norm. But maybe at a minimum, we can find Sabbath moments. We can find spaces within our lives where we recognize ourselves as creatures and where we recognize who God is. And in recognizing the nature of our Sabbath existence, begin to look carefully and look differently at other people. Now, you might say, how can I? I'm so busy or I have so many responsibilities or there's so much going on within, within my life. Or I may be caring for somebody who requires me all the time. Um, and my response to that would be, in order for many people to find Sabbath, they require respite. So respite is necessary in order that Sabbath can be taken. And remember that Sabbath is not something that God says, well, maybe you should do, maybe you shouldn't do. It's a command. So if we take seriously the idea of the body of Christ, that we are intermeshed in that sense, if we take seriously the idea of Sabbath, that we have to find spaces where we can be refreshed and be with God, then the idea of respite uh, becomes fundamentally important. It's not a political concept. It's not a social concept. It's theological in that sense that it facilitates our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ to find Sabbath in that sense. So when we're thinking about respite, respite care, 
Maybe we should think about it in that way. But the idea of finding Sabbath moments is really, really important because when we slow down, when we take time for, as Stanley Hauerwas puts us, those things that the world considers to be trivial, then we begin to look at one another as Sabbath people. Now think about it in this, this context. I've, I've done quite a lot of work recently with um, people with advanced dementia. And if you've ever been with people who have advanced dementia, you can have special moments when things are different. And so somebody appears to be, and I say appears to be, um, somehow distanced or somehow not engaging with the world for a good uh, deal of the time. But then suddenly you catch a moment. Suddenly you'll catch somebody's eye or suddenly you'll catch somebody saying something to you that they wouldn't say in a different context. If you're moving quickly, if you're task-oriented, if you want to get things finished quickly, then you'll miss that. But if you're a Sabbath person, if you're always open to the possibility that there are spaces of peace and that you're looking at people in a particular way, then you'll see these things. And when you see these things, you'll capture something special. Now, my point would not be that somebody with advanced dementia is somewhere else the rest of the time, because I don't think that's the case. But there are moments when you can connect, when you can find your way together. And the final concept that I want us to think about relates to who we are and how we know who we are. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that for many of us, our understanding of our identity is profoundly shaped by time. So we have an autobiographical se sense of who we are. An autobiographical self is one as a self where you can tell your own story. So when I talk to you, you say, who am I? I'll tell you a story about where I've been. I'll tell you where I am. I'll tell you for the future. So you've got an autobiographical sense, self, which feels normal and natural until you begin to experience advanced dementia or until you have, for example, a traumatic brain injury where your sense of self, your sense of story begins to shift and change. So the autobiographical self says, I'll tell, as long as I can tell my own story, I am who I am. And that's why you get such language like, he didn't used to be, he's not the person that he used to be for people with dementia in particular, or she, she would never do that, all these kinds of things. Because an autobiographical self says, as long as I can tell my story, my history, my timeline, I am who I am. But I've been doing a little bit of work with um, Tonya Whaley, who some of you may know, who, um, uh, We've been looking at traumatic brain injury and beginning to work out the idea of what it means to say that your personality changes and how that works itself out along a timeline. And one of the things that we've noticed is that for many people we think that time is linear, that we're moving forward and so therefore something happens and our, our narrative is broken and we move on in a different form. But when we think about it, what we began to, to uh, notice was Paul's language, the Apostle Paul's language of being in Christ. He talks constantly about being in Christ. That, <clears throat> I mean, Karl Barth uh, has, runs along similar lines. He has this idea of soteriological objectivism. There you go, that's one for a cocktail party. <laughs> But basically, he basically means that everything that we are as Christians, we are in Christ. Not because of what we do or what we can do or where we've been. Our identity is always in Christ. So if I consider myself to be a Christian and you ask who I am, first and foremost, I'm in Christ. But then in Colossians, he also says um, who you are, our true self, is hidden in Christ. So we are who we are in Christ, but even what we are in Christ is hidden from us. It's like through a dark, uh, a glass darkly. So whilst um, we might use the language that says, I'm no longer the person I used to be, or she is no longer the person that she used to be, in reality, none of us know who we are, because who we are is always hidden in Christ. And so even in the midst of trauma, even in the midst of um, uh, neurological damage, it's not our autobiography that makes us who we are. It's who we are in Christ. And perhaps that's the beginning point for hope in a context where radical change has occurred, that 
It's not our autobiography that counts. We're always held as who we are in Christ. And of course, the whole motif of in Christ destroys our understanding of linear time and takes us to a very different space, a very different outcome and some radical new possibilities. And so if we begin to think in these ways and begin to expand our imagination in these ways, you can see that disability begins to look different. And oftentimes many of the things that the world, whatever the world may be, values and thinks is wonderful actually turns out not to be the way that things are in God's time. And there are many things through the, the wide diversity of human beings that enable us to see things differently if we just open our eyes a little, expand our imagination and are, have the willingness to look at one another differently. And so the time is full um, and our time is finished. <laughs> Thank you.